good afternoon. Uh, this is Pastor Jim Chinnery here from St. Martin Lutheran Church in Birch Run, Michigan, and we're here looking at some of our scriptures uh, for this coming week, the eighth Sunday in Pentecost, proper 13. And for once, I'm sticking to the lectionary. <laughs> I, don't, I don't always. Sometimes I adjust a little bit here and there, but we're, we're sticking to the lectionary. It makes it easier on Lori. Uh, and on Stephanie as well. We're going to be taking a look at Psalm 100, a very short psalm, only five verses, and yet has a unique place amongst the Psalter, amongst the entire book of Psalms, and we'll talk about that in just a second. And, you know, in, in meditating on Psalm 100 over these past few days and uh, researching the various commentaries and, and things I, I use to uh, improve my own knowledge and, and education on things. Uh, you know, Psalm 100, in a sense, could be summarized as why we're supposed to come to worship. I mean, that's one way you could go with the psalm. In fact, some commentators believe that Psalm 100 would have been used by, by Jews to encourage others to go on pilgrimages to Jerusalem, to, to worship. And I know myself, I, I get this question posed to me in various different forms. Um, in, involving worship, and, and, and it comes in different ways. Some, sometimes people phrase it as, well, uh, more of a statement. You know, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian, right? And, and when someone makes that statement to me, they're seeking for me to justify their, their statement that I don't have to be a Christian and still go to worship. Or sometimes it's phrased in a different way. You know, I can experience God in other ways outside of worship, and, you know, we're... we're I, I can still have my faith and not come to church and all, you know, they're, they're kind of all summarized under the question uh, why we're supposed to worship. God commands us to worship. Let's just start there. We're commanded to worship communally, together, to sing praises to the Lord. We're commanded to in, another, in a number of parts of Scripture. We're going to look at Psalm 100 specifically as it relates to that question, but also answers some other questions as well. So hopefully when we're done today, uh, God's Word working on our heart, if, if anyone in your life comes to you and, and poses that question or makes a statement, all really all summarized under this guise of, do we have to go to worship to be a Christian. We can use this in our explanation. Psalm 100. You can read to them Psalm 100 and say, when you read Psalm 100, what do you think? Because yes, it's true. You can be a Christian and not come to worship, but why on earth would you and I, and now this, this, is, not, this is not speaking to those who for, for very real reasons cannot come to worship. Uh, our homebound ministry here at St. Martin is something we take very seriously and doing our best to bring God's word to those who cannot come. But for most of us, we can come. We've just chosen to do something else with our time. And the problem with that attitude is when we don't place worship as a priority in our life, that trickles down to our kids as well. They see that. We don't have to say anything to them. Uh, just go a number of Sundays where we have chosen to do something else, whether it's sleep in or, or participate in a sporting event or a camp or the hundreds of other things that pull upon us in our time. Uh, that message gets sent very clearly to our kids and our grandchildren, and that is worship isn't that important. So with that in mind, we are going to read Psalm 100. Again, like I said, a very short psalm. In fact, I think I've already talked more, uh, used more words than the psalm has itself. So we're Psalm 100, a psalm for giving thanks. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
Well, I mentioned Psalm 100 is unique amongst all the psalms, and that's the only psalm that has this particular title, and that is a psalm for giving thanks. Only Psalm 100 has that. Now, there are plenty of other psalms, Psalm 118 and Psalm 107, that are, are psalms of praise or psalms of thanks, but this is the only one that has that specific title, a psalm for giving thanks. And now some, some uh, writers have suggested that this psalm was sung at a time when the offering was made during temple worship. Uh, that as, as expressions of gratitude to God for his special deliverance and protect, protection. And it, as you know, in the temple, there was a thank offering that was accompanied by a peace offering, which would be done by the priest. So it's kind of two, but in general, giving thanks as an offering. And, and others have suggested that Psalm 100 was a psalm that would have been sung by pilgrims on their way to Jerusalem to celebrate during one of the, the major festival days in Jerusalem as well. And as one commentator added, it would probably have been used as families tried to convince their family members to come to church. Think about that. Does that not put it in our modern day today? I mean, who, who amongst us does not have uh, family members? Chances are, if you're sitting here watching this, uh, you either come to church regularly or you come when you can. You, you don't have to be convinced that worship is an important part of our life. Uh, maybe the most important part of our life. Uh, that, that's kind of the irony. If, if, and I, I may be preaching on this this Sunday. And, and believe me, the irony is not lost. That I'm going to literally be preaching to people about coming to church who are in church. And yet, remember, part of worship isn't, uh, is about what we can gain so that we can use that and bring it out into the world. And in one sense, worship is almost a, a training ground, if you will, for the faithful to come to be strengthened by the sacrament, to be strengthened with God's word, and then to go out into the mission field. So Psalm 100 contains, first of all, a statement of how to give thanks, very specific, uh, it, an explanation of why God's people must give thanks, why God's people must worship, it's an imperative, it's a command, it's not a suggestion, uh, an, an invitation to give thanks, and then lastly it closes with an expression of praise and thanksgiving and, and why, we're, why we give praise to God because of his qualities. So in verse 1, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. So have you ever, maybe you have someone in your life where, you know, maybe Christmas time comes around or a birthday and you wonder, what can I give them to show my appreciation? You know, they have everything, right? And, and sometimes we have those people. Uh, now, for me, it's easy. If you're thinking about a gift, you know, fishing stuff is always easy for me. Those close to me know that. It's, I, I'm, not a pro I'm not the problem here, right? But we all have people who it's difficult to buy gifts for. Why? Because, you know, in our words, you know, they have everything. And, and so the challenge becomes, what can I give them that's meaningful and useful to them? Well, you know, have you ever thought of uh, applying that question to God? I mean, when you think about it, what can we give God? He doesn't need anything. He doesn't need anything from us. Um, so what, what can we give him? Well, what we can give him is our worship, our joyful worship. Make a joyful noise to the Lord. That, again, is a command. It's not a suggestion. It's not the author of the psalm saying, you know, I suggest that you make it. It's make a joyful noise. It's in the imperative. In verse 2, serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. So this interesting, this, this Hebrew word serve, uh, abdon or abad, abdon, uh, serve in worship. It's used interchangeably. So this easily could read worship the Lord with gladness, serve the Lord with gladness. And, and, and it has this dual meaning, you know, serving as you and I serve our brother and sister in need, but as well as serving the Lord. And, and what the psalm is, is, is commanding us, suggesting to us, is that we serve God by our worship. That is one way in which we serve God. Um, and, and, and also abdon, this Hebrew word, as opposed to serve, worship, it, it means to work. Uh, it, 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 it's this active thing. 
you know, God had commanded his people to keep the Passover every year, every year. Um, and it was time for worship. It's time for service. Exodus 12, and it shall come to pass when you come to the land which the Lord will give you according to what he has promised, that you shall keep this service, that you shall keep this worship. So this is an ancient command given to God's people thousands of years ago to come and to worship and to serve him. And in, in contrast, in contrast, those who do not serve God with gladness and with joy and with worship, by contrast, are by definition not his servants, are not his servants. So that's kind of answer one to, do we really have to come to worship to be a Christian? Uh, well, yeah, because God commands us to worship and serve, and not only to come and show up, but to serve with gladness, and to come before his presence with singing, to show up. You know, in, in many instances, in many difficulties in life, half the battle is just showing up, right? Half the battle is just showing up in uh in all of our counseling with Stephen Ministers or in, in, my, uh, in my doctoral program, I'm, I'm working on uh, training programs for lay people to provide spiritual care to uh, the, the homebound and those in assisted living and nursing homes. You know, one of the first lessons we teach is, you know, showing up. You know, that's half the battle and that's it. Come to worship. If, if you're able to, show up and make it a priority. And then these commands continue. In verse 3, know that the Lord, he is God. That comes from the Shema. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He is our God. That he is God and he is ours. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. And and to know here, in a sense, it, it's, it's an intimate familiarity not just cursory knowledge. You know, we live in a time, and I, and I use it all the time, where, it, you know, if we have, in fact, when we're at home, if we have any question, you just have to shout out, hey, Alexa, you know, what, you know, when does Michigan State play Michigan this year? And you have an answer immediately. We have all this knowledge right at our fingertips. But this, this is not a cursory knowledge. This is an intimate knowledge. So why do we need to come to worship as Christians? Well, to increase our intimacy with God and with our brothers and sisters in Christ. That, that true worship is experienced in relationship with God amongst his people. And, and this knowledge of God becomes specific. Know that he is our creator, that he who made us, and, and that we are his people, that he's our redeemer. So this knowledge is, is focused, knowing that he created us and that he has redeemed us. And then what Psalm 100, uh, pointing on that wonderful image and icon of God in Christ Jesus as shepherd, that we are the sheep of his pasture. You know, Jesus, uh, in, in his discourse in John chapter 10, uh, talked about this in detail on, on what it means. He says, I am the good shepherd. And what does that mean? Jesus says that he's going to lay his life down for the sheep. It means that his sheep are going to hear his voice and we're going to know him. We're going to know him. And I've always thought about that. You know, how can we know the Lord? How can we stay in intimate contact with him unless we're worshiping regularly? How can we as his sheep know his voice? Because I'll tell you, I think it doesn't take very long for when we remove ourselves from that communal worship of God and of Christ, where his voice starts becoming unfamiliar and all the other voices of this world start to drown his voice out. Verse 4, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. Now, Jerusalem was the place where Jewish people were commanded to worship God. That was the place. That was where God was to be found. You know, they got into some battles with the Samaritans. The Samaritans said, no, Mount Gerizim. Um, so there was arguments there. Jesus kind of cleared a lot of that up with the woman at the well when he says a time is coming, a time that you are in now, when it's not about where, what place we worship God, but the fact that we worship him in spirit and in truth. And of course, one of Luther's big battles was the definition of what is the church? What is the church? 
in the Babylonian captivity of the church. He, he defines the location of the church and not where the priests and the bishops and all the guys in the fancy clothing are in the fancy buildings, but where's the church where the believers gather, where the believers gather, wherever that may be, in spirit and in truth, where God's word is preached in its purity and the sacraments are delivered properly. That is where the church is, even if it's just a handful of people. Even if it's just a handful of people. And in verse 5, the, the sort of conclusion here, and reminding us that, you know, there's an aspect of thanksgiving that involves the whole people of God. That worship is about gathering together, increasing our intimate knowledge and faith, as well as strengthening those around us. And then the conclusion, verse 5, is, well, why should we worship God? Well, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. His faithfulness to all generations. That the Lord is good. He is benevolent. That his mercy is everlasting. His hesed, his steadfast love endures forever. I can't remember offhand how many times that Hebrew word hesed shows up in the Old Testament for steadfast love, but it's a whole bunch of times. I, I want to say well over a hundred times that God's steadfast love and his faithfulness to all generations, that God's truth refers to his trustworthiness, that God is faithful to his promises from generation to generation. So we look at Psalm 100 unique in its title, that it's a psalm for giving thanks, but also, I think, a wake-up call for you and I. A reminder that we are, as best as we can to our ability, come and to worship amongst God's faithful people, amongst the saints of the church, to give thanks with joy, to worship him together, to sing his songs. Why? Well, he's good, and his steadfast love endures forever. So, I'll expound upon this probably more uh, on Sunday during the message. So, if you ever come into a situation where someone comes to you and says, you know, I don't think I have to come to church and be a Christian. Well, that's true. You can be a Christian and not come to church. That's absolutely true. But we could apply that to all of our relationships, right? Uh, me as a husband, well, I don't really have to be nice to my wife to be a husband, right? Well, that's true. It's not a good idea. I mean, I, I, I could eat nothing but McDonald's cheeseburgers for the rest of my life and still live. Well, it's true. But if we're truly seeking to repent, daily repentance, turning to God every single day, removing those barriers in our life that separate us from him, then we'll, we'll hear his word clearly, and that is get to church. doesn't have to be St. Martin, although, of course, I'm biased towards our church and the LCMS in particular. Get to church, yes. If you're going to be a good Christian, doing your best to follow his ways, then get to church and bring your kids and bring your grandkids. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Receive the Lord's blessing. Be a blessing to others. Love you guys. And I will see you all very soon. God bless.